Okay. Thank you very much. This is, yes, this is working. Good. Right. Yes, the art of Java type patterns. So we're not talking about regular expression patterns here. We're talking about patterns in the Java language. And this is something which is fairly new and has been added in the past sort of few versions of Java that we've seen. It's something you're going to see more of as well. So let's talk a little bit about what we actually mean by pattern matching, the fundamentals of this. Now, this is something that's been around for a long time. Literally, if you go back in the history of developing computer programming languages, you will find that pattern matching has been used right from the very beginning. You can go all the way back to the 1960s, and you can find languages like Haskell or Orc. Anybody here ever used Orc? OK, good. A few people as old as me, then. Excellent. So what do we mean by a pattern? A pattern has two parts to it. There is what we call a match predicate and a set of pattern variables. And the match predicate is basically something that we're looking to identify and match against. So we have a pattern, and we decide whether what we're looking at matches that pattern. So this is a very sort of simple technique. We have a target, decide whether we match against that. If we do match, then we have our pattern variables, which will be zero or more variables. And we will then assign those based on the fact that we match that pattern. All of this will become very clear as we go through examples and we talk through this. But it's useful to at least get the idea of the fundamentals here. Now, there are also many different types of patterns. First of those is a constant pattern. We've already seen this in Java right from the very beginning. Because if you look at a switch statement, you switch on something like an integer. And then you have case one, case two, case three. That is a pattern which is where we're matching on one or two or three. So it's constant. Because it's constant, there is no variable there. So you don't have any concept of a pattern variable in that case. All we're doing is matching on the pattern and then taking some action in terms of what we do for those case statements. When it gets more interesting is when we have things like a type pattern. In this case, what we're doing is we're matching on a particular type in the programming language, so a class in Java, and we do something based on that. We can take that a little bit further, and we can have what's called a deconstruction pattern. A deconstruction pattern not just matches on what we have in terms of a type, but can then also extract information out of it and use that information where we need to in our code. Again, we'll talk through examples of this as we go through. The next one we have is the var type of pattern. And this uses type inference. If you've been using Java for a while, JDK 10 introduced local variable type inference. We now have the ability to use var as a keyword rather than having to explicitly state the type of a variable that we want to define. Same thing can be used in terms of pattern matching. We'll see how we can use that in a very effective way later on. And then we have the any pattern. And the any pattern matches against anything. So it's sort of a bit like the var, because we don't really care about what the type is. But in this case, we don't care what we're matching against, which might seem a little bit counterintuitive. You're matching against the pattern, but you don't care what it is, and you don't want to use it. So why would you bother matching against it? All will be revealed. Now, before we get into pattern matching, there are a couple of things that we need to talk about in terms of new features that have been introduced in Java over the last probably sort of eight or nine versions that relate very closely to pattern matching. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail to help us understand when we get to the pattern matching part of that. So the first of those is switch expressions. Now, right from the very beginning in Java, we had the idea of a switch statement. We've all used those. We can switch on something. And then, as I said, we can have case statements associated with that. We can then do something with it. The problem with a switch statement is that it's quite error prone. It uses exactly the same syntax that we had in the C programming language. C programming language used for systems type applications, and sometimes the way that things worked wasn't ideal if we're writing sort of higher level application code. A good example of that is where you have your set of case statements, 
you do something based on matching against one of those cases, but then you have to remember to put a break statement in. Because if you don't put a break statement in, the syntax says that you drop through to the next set of case statements. That is the way it's designed to work, and I've actually seen code where that is what it does deliberately. However, has anybody here ever forgotten to put a break statement in a set of cases? Yes, pretty much everybody. That leads to situations where it's quite hard to find the error because you look at what's happening in your code and you say, that can never happen. I have value three and yet I'm doing the work of the value five, for example. And you have to you know, really look carefully to figure out where did I not put in that break statement. The other thing that's um, sometimes difficult with, with switch statements is that the, the very common pattern is where you're switching on one value and you want to assign something to another value. That's fine, but often what you, ha you will find is that you forget to assign a value. And so again, it leads to some harder to debug situations. What we did in JDK 12 was introduce the idea of switch expressions. Rather than just being a statement where you execute a set of instructions, now we can execute that set of instructions, but return a result as well. In the case here, what I'm doing is I'm switching on the day of the week, and I want to assign a value to my number of letters. So that common pattern that we use there. What we can see here is a very different syntax to the way that we would have done this before. And this is good because it's a lot shorter in terms of the code that we generate, but it doesn't lose any of its readability. We can still see exactly what's going on. One of the great things here is that we can eliminate that problem of forgetting to assign a value in a set of case statements because now we only assign the value once. Number of letters is the result of the switch expression. The compiler can check for us that for each set of cases, we either return a value or we throw an exception. So it's good, the compiler can make that check for us. In terms of the syntax, as you can see, we now have case Monday, comma, Friday, comma, Sunday. This is probably one of the most powerful changes to Java in the last few years, is the fact that the developers discovered this thing called a comma separated list. Now we don't have to have a separate case on each line. We can do it with one line of code. We borrowed the arrow operator from Lambda expressions, and the right-hand side of the operator is the value that we return, or, as you can see, the exception that we throw. So this is all good. The important thing about switch expressions is that they must be complete or exhaustive. And we'll come back to what the significance of that is when we talk about pattern matching in a little bit. The other thing we need to talk about before we get into the pattern matching side of things is algebraic data types in Java. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing in Java is something like this. We want to encapsulate data, and it's a very simple encapsulation. It is two values, and we don't want to do anything special with them. We create a class called point. Point has two values, double x and double y, that are encapsulated in there. So we define two instance fields. We then create a constructor, which is called point and takes two values, double x and double y. We have to assign the values from the parameters that are passed to the constructor to the instance fields that we have. And then because they're encapsulated, we need accessor methods that allow us to retrieve those values. So we have double x and double y that return, uh, sorry, x and y that return a double. That's 14 lines of code simply to do a tuple. Now, I always thought that given that we have 4,500 classes in JDK 8, that was the last time I counted, why don't we have a tuple class? And I asked Brian Gertz this, and I said, you know, why don't we have a tuple class? And he said, well, yes, we could give you a tuple class. And then you'd want a triple class, and you'd want a quadruple class, and where do we stop? So they came up with a better solution to the problem. And the solution they came up with is records. Records introduced in JDK 14 as a preview feature. What this allows you to do is to define a simple data type without all of the boilerplate code. It is still a class. It's just a special form of class in the same way that enumeration is a special form of class. Here, in terms of our record declaration, we have the idea of the name, so the point, and then we have a definition of the values that we want to store in that record, double X and double Y. Because it is 
a class, we have the braces, but there's no body to it. What the compiler will do is effectively generate the 14 lines of code that we had on the previous slide for us, so we don't have to write that. This is really good. The other thing that we can do with records is because they are a the class, we can make them generic. We can specify a type parameter and we can store things of type T in our record called anything. We can add more complexity to our class, more functionality to the class, to the record. In this case, I'm adding a static instance field. We can do that. We can add static instance fields, but we can't add instance fields which are not defined in the record declaration. Double radius here, that's fine, but we couldn't add another instance field below that. We can also add other methods like area, which calculates the area of the circle. Now, another thing that we need to be aware of, Java is an object-oriented language. It has inheritance. We can define a type hierarchy like this. So we have a simple hierarchy with shape as the superclass and three subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. This is all good, but we don't have any control over who can subclass shape. The only thing that we can do is all or nothing. We can mark shape as final, which means nobody could subclass it, or if we don't use the final modifier, anybody can subclass it, and that can sometimes be a problem. What JDK 15 did was to reduce the idea of sealed classes. This allows us now to add another modifier to the declaration of our class, so we can say public sealed class shape, and we can say that it permits three subtypes, triangle, square, and pentagon. The compiler then knows that that's exactly the type hierarchy that we have. If somebody were to come along and say, I've got a circle, I want to subclass from shape, it's not going to allow you to do that because it's not defined in the permits clause and the error message will say class is not allowed to extend seal class shape as it's not listed in the permits clause. So, very clear, concise message. Right, so let's move on to the idea of what we actually mean in terms of pattern matching in Java. First thing where this applies is in terms of the instance of operator. Again, this has been in Java right from the very beginning, and it allows us to examine the type of a reference and see if it is of a specific type. Java, as an object-oriented language, has polymorphism. You can view an object as any of the types that it actually represents. That means its specific type, any of the supertypes of that type, and any of the interfaces or super interfaces of those that it implements. In order for you to determine whether it is one of those types, you use instance of. We've all done it, we know what this does and how it works. In this example, I'm saying if obj is an instance of string, then I want to do something with it. Now, in order to do that, I'm constrained because every time that I do it, I have to add this line. I have to add this line which says, take the object reference and assign it to a variable of type string. We'll call it s. And we have to do an explicit cast to tell the compiler to cast that reference to string and make it value s. Which is really redundant, if you think about it, because we've just done the test to see if obj is a type string. Well, yes, it is, if we're in the body of that if statement. So why do we actually have to make that cast and the reassignment? What we've done now by using pattern matching for instance of, which was introduced in JDK 14, is to add pattern matching. So what we do here is we say the pattern that we're looking for, remember, the pattern predicate is saying if obj instance of string. That's our predicate. Is it an instance of string? If it is, the pattern variable that we're going to use is s. The effective code that's generated by the compiler will do the same thing as we saw before. So s will be made a reference to obj and it will be a string so we can reference s and the methods of string from that. But we don't have to explicitly put the, the line of code in there. So it simplifies what we're writing. Now in terms of the, um, the, the valid validity of s, where the, the scope of s is, obviously in the true branch of that if statement, because we do have a string reference, we can reference s. But in the false branch of the 
if statement, we don't have a string, therefore the scope of S is not valid. We can take that a little bit further, and we can add another test to that. We can say, if object instance of string S, and then add the AND operator, and say S.length is greater than zero. This will work quite happily, because we know that the way that the AND operator works is to always evaluate the left-hand side of the operator, and only if it evaluates to true will we evaluate the right-hand side. So if the left-hand side evaluates to true, we know we have a string, S is in scope, and therefore when we test the length of S, S is valid, we can do that, and we can see if it's greater than zero. If we were to try using the OR operator, that doesn't work, because again, we know the way the OR operator works is to always evaluate the left-hand side of the operator, and only if that equates to false do we evaluate the right-hand side. If it, if it evaluates to false, then we know we don't have a string, and therefore the scope of S is not going to be valid, so we couldn't call the length on it and test against zero. So it would give us a compiler error. Now, scoping of our pattern variables is quite important because we can invert the test. What we could do here is say, if not O instance of string S, we return from that method. And what that's going to do is say that from that point on, S is still valid, because of course, if it isn't a string, we've returned from the method. After that, we still have the scope of S being valid, which means we could print out the length, we could have several hundred lines of code, and we can still reference S quite happily. Now, the, again, the scoping of these variables is quite important because it's different to the way that local variable scoping works. If you look at local variables, the scoping of a local variable says that the, the scope is valid from wherever it is defined until the end of the block of code in which it is defined. And that could be uh, a specific block of code where you're using braces, it could be a for statement, it could be a while statement, it could be a method. So wherever that local variable is defined up until the end of that is where the scoping works. The other thing that's very important about local variables is that they're subject to definite assignment. And you'll see this obviously whenever you compile code. If you create a local variable but you don't assign a value to it at any point, the compiler will complain about that. It won't let you compile it. You have to assign a value at some point to your local value, local variable. Now binding variables work in a similar but slightly different way. Binding variables are also subject to definite assignment, meaning that they have to have a value assigned to them. But that actually determines the scope of the variable. Wherever the, var value, wherever the variable has an assignment is where the scope of that variable is valid. So in the case of the if statement, the true branch is where it is valid, therefore that's the scope. In the case of our method where we return from that, the assignment is valid for the rest of the method, so that is the scope of the method. But this is subtly different to local variables. So as a good example of that, if we use um, an if-else set of statements, we could do if o instance of integer num, and do something there, else if o instance of float, and reuse the variable num, because it doesn't have to worry about the fact that we've used it in the first if statement. Similarly, we could do else if o instance of long and reuse num. Only by using flow scoping can we reuse those variable names in that pattern matching example here. If we were using that as local variables, you couldn't redefine them um, multiple times. But in this case, you can, which is very useful because we can reuse the same variable name. We don't have to think about lots of different variable names. Interesting puzzle here. So I came across this piece of code. Let's say I have an object reference called S, and I create a new object, fine. And then I say if S instance of string, and then I reuse S as the pattern variable. So I've got my S as the reference to object, and I'm gonna use S as the pattern variable as well. If it is, then print out the length of the string, otherwise print out no string. So let's have a show of hands here. Who thinks this code will compile? Okay, a few people. Who thinks this code will not compile? 
Okay, more people, that's good. Who thinks this code will both compile and not compile? <laughs> ah, one or two people. Well, the one or two people who said it will both compile and not compile are the ones who get it right. So you think to yourself, well, hang on, how can it both compile and not compile? How does quantum superposition interfere with this kind of thing? And the reality is that if you put that code into your IDE, so if you're using IntelliJ, you put it into your IDE and you try and compile it, um, even IntelliJ will actually reject it. It will say, no, you've already used S as a variable name, you can't use it a second time. But if you put it into J shell, it will work. I have no idea why. And I've asked many people this question as to why it works. And I, I, I literally, I keep testing on each new version of Java, Java as it comes out, and it keeps working. And I really don't understand. I think that the, every time I've done this presentation before, and I've, I've had people from Oracle in the audience, and they've looked at it and they've gone, that's a bug. Okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think that's actually a bug in my, t in my uh, slide, actually, because the example I test definitely has S dot length in it. But you're right. Good. Well spotted. Excellent. Right, next thing to talk about is pattern matching for switch. Obviously, we talked about the idea of switch statement and switch expression. If you look at the way a switch statement works, or even a switch expression before, it's limited in what you can switch on. You can switch on a numeric or integral value, you can switch on a string, or you can switch on an enumeration. Now what they've done is expand that to allow you to switch on a type pattern. So we can do something like this. We can have our method called type tester, we switch on a reference called O, and then we have some cases. First case is null, and this is interesting, we'll talk a little bit more about this, because previously we couldn't have a case which was null. We would have to do a test for null outside of the switch statement. So this is very useful, the fact that we can include null in there. But then we have cases which have type patterns in them. In fact, the first one is a type pattern as well. It's just that it's a constant type pattern because, of course, null is null is null, and we don't therefore need a type variable associated with it. In the case of our string, we can have a variable s, and we can print out the value of the string. In the case of color, we can have a variable C and we can take the RGB value of that. Now, primitives are not types in the Java programming language, so you can't have a case of int on its own, but an array of primitives is a type. So you can have a case for int array, and then you can print out the length of that on the right-hand side. And of course, you can have a default in there as well to print out whatever is there. Now, I said null is special in this case. We have this new idea of case null, which we can use in both switch statements and switch expressions. So that is a difference because it has, is a change to switch statements as well. And the, the way that that works is that if you don't include a null case, in order for the backwards compatibility to work, what the compiler will do is insert a specific case for you with null and throw a null pointer exception. Example here, we don't have a case for null, so we have switch on O, we've got string, color, int array, and default. What the compiler will actually generate is to insert the case null, which will then throw a null pointer exception. The code will behave in exactly the same way as it would before, so there's no issue with backwards compatibility. So um, we take questions at the end. Now, what you can do as well is you can combine the null with default. So if you say to yourself, right, I want to test for these particular things, string, color, and int array, and then I want to handle null and default in the same way, then you can do that by simply specifying case null comma default. And I actually tried this as well because I always like trying to see how far you can push the language syntax. And I found that you could actually do case default up until JDK 20. They, they tightened up the syntax in JDK 20, so that's no, now no longer valid. But prior to that, you could actually do case default as well as default. Um, it was just a, you know, sort of an edge case that they, uh, they found. 
I mentioned completeness earlier on, and I said that in the case of uh, switch statements and switch expressions, uh, sorry, well, switch expressions um, and switch statements, uh, which have to be exhaustive, what we need to do here is understand what we mean by that. So I can do my type tester, and I can switch on O, and I could have case string S and case integer I. Great. So if I've got a string or an integer, that's wonderful. But what happens if I pass in a float or something else? Then how do we handle that? Well, you could argue that because it's not listed in the set of cases, we simply ignore it and, part and move on. Because technically, you could call a switch just a multiple if then else kind of thing. But the decision was made that that's not what they wanted to do, because it could lead to a lot of subtle errors that are hard to find again. What we have to do is we have to include a default in this case, because that way we are complete, exhaustive. We cover all possible types. If it's a string, we do this. If it's an integer, we do this. If it's anything else, it gets caught by the default. Now, that doesn't mean that every switch statement or all type switch expressions have to have a default, because if we look at our sealed types or sealed classes from earlier on, we could do something like this. And we could say switch on shape, and we have case triangle, case square, case pentagon, and case shape. Because it is a sealed class, those are the only possible things that you can represent with that reference. So there is no need to have a default in this case. You can simply say triangle, square, pentagon, and shape, and everything is covered. So it will work, it will compile. That is a complete switch statement. Guarded patterns are where we take the idea of our pattern that we're matching against and we extend it a little bit further in the same way that we saw earlier on with the instance of operator. What I can do here is I can say, I'm going to switch on shape, great. And I'm gonna have case triangle T, but then I also want to add another test to see if the size of that triangle is above a certain value. And I can do that by saying, and t dot area greater than 25. I can then have another case statement underneath that for triangle T, which will catch anything which isn't area greater than 25 and print out it's a small triangle. And then I've got square, pentagon, and shape. Now, technically, I didn't need the second line because even though I've caught triangle and it's greater than 25, you might say, well, I have to have the triangle caught as well. But because shape is the superclass of triangle, I could also catch the triangle which is less than 20 or less than equal to 25 with the shape case as well. But in this case, I'm going to add the, the triangle T on its own so I can print out it's a small triangle. Now, this is JDK 18. JDK 18, they used the same AND operator that we saw on the instance of operator. So we've got primary pattern, double ampersand, conditional AND expression. In JDK 19, they changed it. They changed it to use WHEN. So now a guarded pattern says case triangle T WHEN T dot area is greater than 25. As we'll see, I'm not convinced that this is necessarily a particularly good idea to make this change. I get why they did it, because it makes it a bit more readable. You know, you've got more kind of English in there, if you like. So it's case triangle T when T dot area is greater than 25. But we all know the AND operator, so why shouldn't we just continue using that? Now, this only works for patterns. It doesn't um, work if you're doing, um, you know, case foo when something else. Right, where when is, is important. I said that I like to push the language as far as I can. So let's create an abstract class called interrogator. And that's gonna permit several other classes, who, what, where, when, and why. And then we're gonna have a class called when, obviously, which extends interrogator, great. And we'll define a method in there called when, which is Boolean and will just return true. What we can then do is we can take our test question, pass in an interrogator, switch on question, and we can have a set of cases for that. Obviously, we could have a case for what, 
and we'll use a pattern variable, what, so we have print out what. Same for where, same for why. And in the default, we'll have just print out how. What we can then do is we can say case who, what, when, where, why. The reason this will work is because if we dissect this, we have a pattern match on the type what. We're then using a pattern variable, sorry, pattern type who, and we're using a pattern variable what. When is the indicating that we have a guarded pattern, and it's a contextual keyword. That's a very important thing about when. It's a contextual keyword. It only behaves as a keyword when it's in a particular place, and that particular place is in this case where we're then testing against another thing as well. So when is our guard, and the guard is to test where, so we call where, which is Boolean returns true or false, and then we're going to call why on the right-hand side. But we could take that one step further, because of course we also need the case for when. So we have case when, 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 dot when, when. And this will work, because what happens here is that we have our type pattern, when, and then we're using a type variable, when, and then the compiler can actually determine that that's a type variable, and then the next when is the when that indicates we have a guard, and then the next when is the type variable again, which we're then going to call the when method on, and then on the right-hand side, we're just going to call the when method locally. Pattern dominance is another thing that we need to be aware of. And in this case, what we need to ensure is that we don't hide the patterns lower down. If we take that example from earlier and we move the shape reference to the top, obviously shape is the superclass of triangle, square, and pentagon, which means that all of those are technically, through polymorphism, shapes. So that would mean that when we try and do this, the compiler will reject it because it will say shape will almost match first and all of those cases underneath have then become unreachable. It, it will never be able to do that. So we, we can't compile that. We also need to be a little bit careful when we use a guarded pattern. And again, if we take the other example here, we, if we do case triangle T and we put the guarded version underneath triangle T when T dot area greater than 25, obviously we'll always match the first one as a triangle. We will never get to the guarded pattern. And so the compiler will reject that because it will say that our match is dominating the one underneath. Doesn't mean that all uh, guarded patterns have to be um, in, at the top because this, which is a, a, a bad example of, of code, you know, when case triangle T when true, it's always going to be true, isn't it? Um, so that would then uh, dominate the unguarded pattern. And so you can't do that. Not that you ever would. So it is a compile time error for a label in a switch block to be dominated by an earlier label in that switch block. That is the, the definition in the language. Pattern matching instance of and records. OK, so we can pattern match on a record. It's a type. It's a class. So we could have our record point, double x, double y. And we could say, OK, let's create a method called Pythagoras, which seems very appropriate for where we are. And we'll pass in an object O, and we'll see if O instance of point P. So we're doing our type uh, predicate, which is O instance of point, and type variable P. We can then extract the values from that record, P dot X, P dot Y, and we can calculate the hypotenuse quite happily. But what we can now do is do better than that. This is one of those deconstruction patterns that I mentioned at the beginning. What we do here is we can say, define, we're passing in an object, if O instance of, and then give the record declaration. So we say, if in the case of instance of point double X, double Y, when we calculate the hypotenuse, because we're deconstructing that pattern, we can then reference X and Y as the values contained in the record and calculate the hypotenuse without having to explicitly extract the values first, because the, the pattern is doing that deconstruction for us. Patterns are composable. This is very useful. Let's have an interface called rectangle, and we'll use our point, double X, double Y, introduce an enumeration, red, green, and blue color, and then we'll create a couple of new records, one of which is a color point, which takes a point P and a color C, and then we'll create a color rectangle, which takes two color points, top left, 
bottom right and implements our rectangle interface. So now we can use our deconstruction pattern and we can say if our instance of color rectangle and specify the record definition, so color point top left, color point bottom right, and we can print out top left dot C to print out the color. But we know that color point is a record, so top left is a record as well, so let's deconstruct that. So now we can do our instance of color rectangle, color point, point P, color C, color point, and we'll call it BR to simplify things, and we'll print out C. But we can go one step further, because point P is also a record. So if we wanted to create a method called print top left X, pass in a rectangle, if our instance of color rectangle, color point, point double X, double Y, color C, color point BR, print out X. This is really useful because it's powerful, but obviously you're going to look at that and think to yourself, that's great, but it's not really becoming a lot simpler, is it? It's starting to look very complicated. How can we do better than that? Well, what we could do is we can use the var type pattern that we had before. And that basically uses local variable type inference introduced in JDK 10. Now what we can do is we can simply say, we know that there are things there, but we don't care what their type is because we're just going to use them underneath. Let's use var and we'll say color rectangle, color point, point, var x, var y, var c, var br. And everything works in exactly the way that we want it to. So that's good, but we can go one step further because there is the any pattern. Remember I said the, the any pattern. This uses the single underscore. And um, back in JDK 9, single underscore went from being um, something you could, if you really wanted to, use as a variable name to a reserved word. And one of the reasons for that was because they, they had thought about future use. And so this is where we see it being used, hopefully, in JDK 21. It's not in the, the JDK yet. But essentially what we can do is we can say, okay, let's, let's accept that we have things that we know have to be there, but we don't care what they are. So rather than having anything, uh, so here we've got color rectangle, color point, point var x, because x is the thing we actually want to use. But all of the other things, the compiler needs to know there is something there to have the correct format of the records, but we basically don't care what they are in terms of type, and we don't care what they are in terms of a variable. So let's not bother with that. Let's simply put an underscore there and the compiler knows there should be something there, but we don't need to reference it. So that, that will hopefully work. Um, named record patterns. These are, these are actually dropped in JDK 20 and there's a very good reason for why they dropped them in JDK 20. So what we can do is let's create a shared point, which has an is shared Boolean method. And then we've got a point 2D and a point 3D. So double X, double Y, double X, double Y, double Z, okay? And then both of them have is shared as methods. What we could do is something like this. We could say case point 2D, so we're using a deconstruction pattern to define the record, but we'll also add in a variable for our pattern so that we can reference the point 2D as well. So we can see, we can print out if it's shared. So in this case, I could print out 2D, P is shared plus the value of X and that would work. So we've now got a, a value, I've got a variable for the, the pattern, and we've got the deconstruction of the record. So you think that's useful. Okay, well it is, except if we add a guard to it, well that's okay, because do P when P is shared. All right, great. Unfortunately, um, when you try and do what I like to do, which is to do this, so you say case point 2D double X double Y, when, when, true. Unfortunately, at this point, you have an ambiguous situation because the, the way that the compiler can interpret that has two different ways, both of which are completely valid. You could think of the first when as being the guard and the second when as calling the local when method with the value true in brackets as a parameter, or you could take the first when as the pattern variable, the second when as the guard, and the true in brackets as simply the test, which is always going to be true. So the compiler will just basically get confused and it will say, can't ref find symbol, blah, blah, blah. So they did away with that, which is probably very logical. Last thing to mention is pattern matching for arrays. 
this was something that was going to be included um, because it's, again, deconstruction pattern. It's the idea that if we can do things with records, why can't we do the same thing with arrays? If O instance of string array and the length is greater than two, let's extract out elements zero and one and print out the concatenation of those. So we could use the definition of a, a string array using the braces. We could use the ellipsis to indicate that we have you know, var args there, so it's many more than two elements, potentially. And we could just simply reference string S1 and string S2. Now, as I say, that was going to be, it was part of JET 405, but they dropped that before it got included. So I haven't seen anything that says when that will be uh, a feature in JDK, um, well, 20, certainly 21 or maybe 22. Summarize then. Um, pattern matching is a very powerful set of language features, language constructs, and it def definitely simplifies a number of, of different tasks. It helps to eliminate a lot of boilerplate code, it makes things a lot more declarative, and the important thing is obviously you don't lose readability, because once you get used to pattern matching, it becomes very clear what's actually going on. Um, also has the potential for better optimization, um, and so that, that's a good thing as well. Some features already included, some more to come. Uh, there's, there's actually more plans for pattern matching uh, beyond what I've talked about here. And so with that, thank you very much.